from Renaissance. Let's start something new. Let's call it Baroque. Oh, this is a great question. So basically what happens is, okay, so the, the Protestant Reformation happens, right? Um, and the church actually calls a council to react to this, right? So this is the Council of Trent. You might have heard of this. The Council of Trent is a meeting when the church is discussing, okay, maybe we need to make some reforms. And this is important to us because the church decides to make reforms in terms of the art, right? What they think art should do, um, how art can serve the church. So they, the Protestants in general, want to do away with art. They think that art is getting in the way of people's personal interactions with the divine. Um, art is something that's a distraction. Um, and so actually, like, if you enter into a Protestant church, you won't see a lot of art on the walls. You'll see bare walls. If you go into a Catholic church, you'll see art everywhere. Because what the church officially states, basically, is that art should still be produced, that the church should still support the arts, but that art should be used to um, help people have a personal relationship um, with the divine. So that art should be um, more clear. It should not be idealized. It should be more direct, more honest. Um, and if we go look back to, uh, you know, our Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith and Holofernes, we see that as a more kind of true to life, more honest depiction, less idealized depiction, more realistic depiction of that subject matter. And this is what the church thinks art should do in response to the Protestant Reformation. So they actually like write some rules about like how art should look and what art should do in response to this. So, so it's not like everybody sort of woke up and like, we're like, okay, now we make Baroque art. This is sort of a, a decree that went out from the church and then artists responded to it. And Caravaggio um, is this main Italian artist who we will look at, who really kind of pushed art forward at this time. Um, he's really the one who started to make paintings where holy figures um, looked like regular everyday people in 1600s Rome. And he literally would take people off the street into his art studio and would have them pose for him. Whereas like if you look back at Renaissance art, remember those artists are like sort of looking at Greek and Roman statues, right? Think about Botticelli's Venus. I mean, he's like looking at a statue of Venus and then painting Venus. Um, Caravaggio is using, he's grabbing drunk people from the bars, homeless people off the street, bringing them into his studio and saying, you pose, you be St. Peter, you be St. Matthew, you're going to pose for me and be Jesus. And when some of these paintings were shown, people were like, what are you doing? Like, you can't paint you know, St. Peter as a homeless guy with dirty fingernails. You can't paint Mary as like a tattooed like gang member, right? And he's doing this. He does a painting of Mary, um, the death of the Virgin, that supposedly was based on him um, looking at, who knows if this is true, the body, the, the corpse of a prostitute who, whose body was pulled out of the river like shortly there before. Um, and people were really upset. They were like, you can't paint holy figures in this way. But for Caravaggio, his point was like, we need to think of these holy figures like us, that they're human like us, right? So this is kind of that, that difference. Wow. Um, okay, so what are some of the key? So this is one of the main differences that really like the church calls for a new kind of art and artists respond. So what kinds of things um, will we see? How are artists responding? Um, number one, we're going to see really strong diagonal lines um, and something that Cheyenne mentioned earlier, um, asymmetrical compositions. We're going to see something that you all noted was this really dramatic lighting, um, this black, flat black background and this kind of spotlight or candlelight effect. Um, we'll also see um, exaggerated motion. So these diagonal lines are creating motion. And we'll see when we look at the subject matter, 
Baroque artists will choose to depict the moment of action, not the moment before or the moment after, but the moment of action. And we saw that in the comparison that we just did, right, with Artemisia um, and um, Botticelli. Botticelli, the Renaissance version is after the fact. The Baroque version is right in the middle of the action. Um, and we'll see this when we look at Bernini David. Um, and so why, what is the goal? The goal is to create a dramatic moment, um, a moment of um, emotion where the viewer has an emotional response, not an intellectual response, an emotional response. And so here we kind of see like, whereas the Renaissance is associated with logic and reason, the Baroque period is really about embracing emotional responses. Um, and something that you'll notice when you look at Baroque art is a theme that's really popular. There's like themes of transformation, um, religious ecstasies, transformative experiences, um, where people who aren't Christian convert to Christianity. Um, these transformative experiences are meant to sort of parallel this idea of like, Yes, the church has lost a lot of followers because of the Protestant Reformation, right? And maybe you, as the viewer, maybe you have lost some faith in the church. Maybe you have lost your way a little bit. But you can see this art and you can have a transformative spiritual experience through the process of viewing the art and you can come back to the church. This is what, this is the message that the church wants to spread to the people that you can come back, that we're reforming and we want you to come back to us. Are you saying that as the churches were losing members, people, and then they were using art to bring them back to church? Yes, I am very clearly saying that. Yes, 100%. Um, 100%. 100%. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, mine just no doubt. The... <laughs> I mean, it's basically propaganda. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like it shows like the realistic views of like what every person like would go through, you know, like putting figures there. And it's like, you know, kind of like, hey, join me, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like when you look at the art, like you see these human emotions and you're like, I have that feeling too, right? Yeah. And when the figures are depicted in modern clothing, I know everything looks old to us, but for them, those were modern clothes. You're like, hey, that person looks like me, mm -hmm. right? And that's a holy person. And like, maybe I can see myself in that person. And like Renaissance was more like, like storytelling, but now it's like more of like modernized. Basically, what do you say? <laughs> it's like yeah. logos. What's that? It's like logos, basically. You make a look like kind of like their own, like kind of poster child or something. But yeah. Using holy figures. Yeah, like, like the Renaissance is more like logical, where you're, yeah, you're just getting the story. Whereas Baroque is like, you could be the main character of the story. You can see you. In the story. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. and so that's what it is. It's really like your personal experience. Relatable, uh, I guess. What's that? Relatable, yeah, like, yeah, more relatable. Make it more relatable. Exactly, relatable, yeah. Um, okay, so you'll see on the screen now the information about what I was talking about earlier the Council of Trent, right? So, this is this meeting that happens, um, and like basically the Catholic Church is like, Hey, we have lost the Catholic Church, lost one quarter of um, its followers to Protestantism, so they were like, We need to respond, um, and so they respond. Um, with this decree about like what art um, needs to look like now. Um, do I have it somewhere? Let me find it. I thought I had it. I guess I don't. Um, okay, so what else is happening in Europe at the time? Obviously, there's the Protestant Reformation. Um, somebody's putting hearts all over it. I love it. <laughs> Um, there's the going on? information. Um, what else is happening is that um, Europeans are also colonizing the Americas at this time, right? Um, and they think of um, New Spain 
as like this whole new world where they can like recover some of the losses of the Protestant Reformation. And like, there are all these new potential members who can like join the church. Um, and there's also a lot of developments in terms of science, mathematics, um, philosophy. Galileo publishes um, his writings. And these scientists, when they're publishing these things, they're kind of like considered enemies of the church, right? Because what they're True. saying was against church teachings. Um, so it was kind of a wild time um, to be alive. Um, so what does that mean for us? Like, how does the Catholic church respond? Basically, here's what they say. They say that art should be about spiritual transformation. That art that's produced for churches should really be about the personal human experience of the divine and personal spiritual transformation. Okay. We see some other things happening. Um, Europe begins to kind of take on some of the modern divisions that it has today. Um, we start to see a shift in terms of power. Rome loses power because of this, um, you know, really dramatic shift. Um, and power shifts more. There are um, countries in Northern Europe, the Netherlands, for example, um, who are gaining power. Um, there is, the Netherlands is like a newborn country at the time. So like they have been controlled by Spain and like part of the Netherlands becomes free and becomes Protestant and the other part um, is still under Spanish control and the other part is modern day Belgium. So Belgium and the Netherlands used to be one country. They separate at this time. The Netherlands gains independence from Spain and becomes a Protestant country and they're a country without an aristocracy. So they don't have the Catholic Church and they don't have nobility who are the two main patrons of the arts. So we have a whole new kind of class of patrons mm. from the North who are middle class, people. middle class people start buying paintings in the Netherlands. And what do they buy? Still life paintings, landscape paintings, um, group portraits, and genre paintings. And we looked at still life paintings already when we were at the museum. Do you remember? You're right. Yeah, paintings yeah. of inanimate objects. Um, landscape paintings are what they can like, paintings of the land. So we see landscapes in Renaissance paintings, but they're in the background, right? They're behind the holy figures. When we get to the Baroque period and we look at Northern Europe, we see paintings where the whole subject matter is the landscape itself. And like, this is kind of a new idea in the Baroque period. Um, we'll also see um, genre paintings in the North. Um, so I want you to read through some slides, but I want to show you some um, images. Where is the genre painting? Oh, here we go. Genre paintings are a new type of painting that's popular in the North. That's basically like a painting of everyday people doing everyday things. So it's not, um, it's not a king on a throne. It's not a holy figure. It's just a regular person doing regular everyday things. And you can see that here in this Vermeer painting um, of a woman pouring milk in a Dutch kitchen. And we'll talk about that more um, next week. This week, I just want to look at like what's going on really in Italy um, and, uh, and Spain. But Italy is Spain. So in, in um, Baroque sculpture, we're going to see strong diagonal lines. Um, which we see here. Um, we, I think we looked at this image of Daphne and Apollo the first week of class. Do you remember this? Yeah. The when story too. Daphne is trying to escape Apollo and she prays to her dad for help and he's like, I got you. Don't worry about it. And he turns her into a tree. Yeah. Remember that story? Yeah. 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 Her turning into a tree. This is an example of Baroque art. Here we see strong diagonal lines that create a sense of movement and drama. Um, and all of this is very typical of Baroque art. Um, here's another comparison. On the left, you see Michelangelo's David. You know this sculpture, yeah? Yeah. Right. On the right, we see a sculpture by the Italian artist Bernini, Gian Lorenzo Bernini. You need to know this guy's name. This guy is like the main sculptor in um, Baroque Italy. His name is so, Bernini. Bernini. 
and I'll show you some more images by him in a minute. But we can see um, a much more dramatic sculpture. This is actually a moment when an angel is about to pierce a nun. Um, with the love of God and she becomes overwhelmed with the love of God um, and we see a really dramatic depiction of this um, moment. Wow. Oh, can people turn off their microphones if you're not talking because there's background noise? Oops. Thanks. Uh, okay. Asymmetrical compositions, strong diagonal lines, this really dramatic lighting. And I think somebody was talking about this earlier that this like really dramatic chiaroscuro, there's actually a word for it, it's tenebrism. Tenebrism is dramatic chiaroscuro. And it's what Caravaggio is known for. And then of course, dramatic interpretations of subject matter. So we won't necessarily see new subject matter, it'll just be reinterpreted and shown in new and different ways. Um, and this tenebrism um, is something that Caravaggio is known for. So here's that name that I've been saying today, Caravaggio. Um, you gotta know this guy. Caravaggio is the leading, most important um, Baroque artist in Rome at the time. Um, and he's kind of a scandalous figure. He has kind of a wild life. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about him. Okay, so dramatic lack naturalism. I just wanna make sure I cover all these things. Um, expressive sense of movement, diagonal lines. The figures take up this, the, all of the space. So remember when we looked at like early Renaissance art and we would see like the whole landscape and like a line of people coming to see Jesus and like there, it would be like a wide view, like a wide angle view. When we get to the Baroque period, we're really like tightening up and like looking in closely. Um, and there'll just be like a few figures in the, in the scene, right? Just like two or three people, just the essential people will be depicted. And that, that tightness, that, comp that tight composition is going to make things feel more intimate. Italian Baroque paintings show more emphasis on the focal point. Yes, in fact, like they'll be just about the focal point. And I mean, you can just, Look back to like some of the paintings we were just looking at. Um, you know, if you look at our earlier comparison, we we don't see in the Renaissance version. We have the background, the hills, the farmland, the city off in the distance. We have a vast sense of space. In the Baroque version, we're in the room with them, right? And there are only three people there, just the essential members. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I remember when we were at the Getty um, and you had us uh, take pictures of, um, oh, what was it called? Like still life uh, uh -huh. with like, you know, just like a, a bowl of fruits or something like that. Uh -huh. um, weren't those, were those paintings Baroque? I want to say they were in that same century. Yes, they are um, And just cause you were talking about how like there is much, a much more focus on, the subject matter. I don't know why that kind of like ring my brain made me think about how Yeah, well, think of it like, okay, that's, no, it did because it's kind of like, if you take a whole scene, right, you'll have people sitting at a table and all the stuff on the table in the background. But if you just yeah. zoom into like a tight, like portion of that scene, you'll just see the flowers on the table or you'll just see the ball of fruit. So there is this kind of like, kind of zooming in that's happening in the Baroque period. When you said that, that's just kind of what my head, well, yeah. what I like was thinking about. Yeah, yeah. interesting. That's what triggered it. Um, mm. So next week, I'm going to talk about um, the Dutch Baroque and all the new subject matter, landscape, still life, genre painting. Um, the new kind of model for painting in, in the Netherlands is really different because it's a Protestant country. Because we don't see representation of holy figures in Protestant countries at this time. There's basically no religious art produced in the 17th century, um, especially in the Netherlands. All we see is non-religious art, also known as secular, right? Remember that term, secular art? Um, okay, and then I'll also talk next week about um, French art. And when we look at French art, we'll see that they kind of retain some of the ideals of Renaissance art, 
Um, so this is usually called French Baroque classicism, which is more like they're more tied to Renaissance style. They don't go as dramatic as the Italians do. So what are we going to see when we look at Counter-Reformation art? And Counter-Reformation art is a term that's used um, to apply to the countries that remain Catholic. So Italy, Spain, and Flanders, which is modern day Belgium. These countries remain Catholic. Um, also France, but France has like its own thing going on, right? They have that French Baroque classicism. So what are we going to see? Dramatic art, religious imagery, images uh, from the lives of Mary and Jesus, miracles, martyrdoms of saints, monks, nuns, and priests. So um, saints become more important in this time period. In the Renaissance, there's a lot like Mary and Jesus. In the Baroque period, we have lots of paintings of different, all the different saints. Um, and we also have paintings of like martyrs and recent martyrs, like people who are Christians who become canonized as saints kind of like recently at that time, at the time what was recent. Um, we also see an emphasis on transformative moments, spiritual awakenings, religious ecstasies, um, moments where people are transformed because this is what the church wants um, its followers to experience, to experience a transformative moment. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Does anybody know the story of the conversion of St. Paul? No. Uh, um. Is this when Saul turned into Paul and was blinded for three days and, and all that? that yeah, yes. Like that? Yeah. yeah. I thought so. Yeah. So Saul, okay, so Saul is this guy um, who's, oh, hold on a second. Saul is this guy who's um, a Roman, right? And he's on the road to Damascus. He's riding his horse. Um, and he's going to go to Damascus and he's going to engage in one of the Romans' most favorite sports, torturing Christians. Right? Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, that's what the Romans did, right? At a time, so th we're talking about ancient Rome. Like, we're talking about, like, the time in early Christianity when, like, Christianity was still illegal, right? Right. Paul is this ancient Roman who's going to Damascus to torture Christians. He's, like, literally on the road to go torture them. Um, and while he's on the road, he gets not, he's blinded by a light and gets knocked off his horse and falls to the ground and is blinded by this light. And he says, who's there? What's happening? And he hears the voice of Jesus and Jesus speaks to him and says, what are you doing? Like, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute my followers? Like, what's your deal? And Saul has a transformative moment. He's overwhelmed by this golden light of Christ and he's filled with the love of Christ. And he, he transforms and changes his mind and decides to no longer torture Christians and instead to convert. And he converts to Christianity and becomes a follower of Jesus um, and changes his name from Saul to Paul. And this is, this is his moment of conversion, right? So he is somebody who is against Christianity, like most Romans were at the time, and he converts and has a transformative experience. And this, so this is something that happened like over a thousand years before, right? This is a biblical story. And this moment is being reused in the Baroque period to say to people like, hey, if you've lost your way, if you've strayed away from the church, or if you don't believe in the church anymore for whatever reasons, like you can have a transformative moment. You can have this direct spiritual moment with God and you can come back to Christianity, right? You can convert. Saul was persecuting Christians and now he's a saint, right? Now he's, he becomes a Christian and then he becomes a saint. Like, so if Saul can go from torturing to Christians to becoming a saint, like, what can you, dear viewer, looking at this Caravaggio, like, what can you experience? How can your life change if you embrace Christianity, if you embrace Catholicism, if you come back to the church? This is the message of these paintings. Yeah? Okay, so this is their first, like, official poster. 
like saying, oh, like you can do this too. Like you can, yeah. yeah. If St. Paul can do it, uh, well, St. Saul can do it, you could too. Yeah, like if Saul can go from torturing Christians to becoming a Christian to now he's like canonized as a saint, like what spiritual journey awaits you as, as the viewer? Now, one thing about this painting by Caravaggio, um, the way that it's positioned is that when you are the viewer in the church, you would like go up to the painting and you would kneel down before it and like your eyes would sort of line, like your head would be where the head of St. Paul is. So you're really like, you're, you feel like Paul lying on the ground, looking up at this, you know, horse, um, looking up at this golden light after being like, you know, falling off your horse, right? So you're kind of like in his position, right? Maybe you've lost your way too, um, but you can have a transformative experience and come back to the church. Um, this is kind of the message that the Catholic Church um, wants to get out to people through these images. That's were very these, ingenious. Yeah, were these, uh, were these um, pieces commissioned for one specific church or did they travel throughout? They're, they're, the no, they're, they're commissioned for specific churches. So in fact, most of Caravaggio's paintings are actually in churches in Rome today. Um, so they don't, they're not meant to travel. They're commissioned specifically for churches, for specific chapels in specific churches. Um, some, some of the paintings do travel, but most of the ones in, that were like meant for churches um, have just stayed in those churches for all these hundreds of years. Um, so you gotta go to Rome if you wanna see some of these in person. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about this. Um, okay, so this is um, for the church Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome. So you have to go to Rome to see it. Um, it's quite a large painting, seven feet by six, um, by almost six feet across. Um, so the figures are monumental, like, you know, life-size figures. So when you're looking at this painting and you're in the like position of um, St. Paul, like he's life size. He's like the same size as you. Does that make sense? Yeah, during that'll the, work. Has a question. Um, during the Baroque period, were there still donors or was it mostly the Catholic church? Great question. There are donors. So most of these paintings are commissioned by people who are then giving them to the church, right? So like some rich person or a cardinal or a bishop will be like, Caravaggio, I want you to make a painting for the Church of Santa Maria del Popolo. So there, it's still members of the church. It's not the Pope necessarily, but they're still kind of members of the church who are commissioning most of these paintings. Um, let's look at the painting and talk about the style. How is the style typical of Baroque art? So the subject matter we talked about, what about the style? Very dark. Um, like asymmetrical. Okay, good. Asymmetrical composition. Mm -hmm. um, very dark, flat background. No sense of a landscape, right? Very natural. Yeah, a sense of diagonal lines with the okay. arms. And okay, really good. Strong diagonal lines here with the arms of, of Saul reaching up. Strong the horse's leg. Lines, the horse's leg lifted. All of these diagonals create a sense of movement. What else? There's a lot of naturalism, especially with the, uh, based on the emotions, like um, St. Paul, like down there, with his eyes closed, kind of trying to reach out to something, uh, like yeah. the line, Paul the light. Like reaching up, he's blinded by this light, you know, and yeah. he's reaching up, so it's a very dramatic thing. Um, it's, there's like emotional response, like you imagine yourself being knocked off a horse and being blinded. Um, we have this really dark, um, overall dark tones, warm color palette, earth tones. This is typical of the Baroque period. Browns, warm golden tones, yellow, red. There's no baby blue sky, right? There's right. no soft pastels. It's warm earth tones, um, really tight composition. Right, with just three figures, a horse, Saul, and like, I don't know, his attendant who's helping him with the horse. That's it. Oh, is that his attendant? I thought that was Jesus. No, that's his attendant. Uh, okay. <laughs> and it's super detailed. Like you can see, look, you can see like 
the his leg and stuff, right? Yeah. Jesus is not depicted. Jesus is like the golden light that's shining, the, that's blinding him, right? So Jesus is not depicted bodily. Okay. I so, just thought it was like Jesus coming out of the woodwork, like Jesus saying is like. Just like this light that blinds him. Okay. You can also see like all of the details, like this guy's like wrinkled forehead and, you know, his, his like slightly balding and he's got like these visible veins in his feet and like, you know, I don't know, dirty toenails. So it's like very yeah. <laughs> extremely realistic, right? It's not idealized. It's not beautiful, right? In the way that like, I don't know, Botticelli's Venus is beautiful, right? It feels more real, more like... Anything else? Talked about the iconography. So Saul has this mystical moment of transformation um, while he's on his way to go um, persecute Christians. And so Saul, like Caravaggio is depicting the moment of transformation, of conversion, right? And this is what Baroque artists become really interested in, this specific moment of transformation or conversion, because this is what, like, the promise is that, like, anyone can feel this. Like, if you lost your faith, you can get it back. That's the, that's the hope, you know? Um, okay, so talked about the tenebr Okay, tenebrism is this term that we use to talk about the way Caravaggio uses light, this dramatic, it's like, it's like chiaroscuro on crack, right? Chiaroscuro taken to an extreme. It's almost unreal. Like if you're riding a horse and you're on the road, like it wouldn't be like this dramatic. It's like a spotlight, a spotlight effect. Like, like somebody shining a light on the scene, like a flashlight or something, like a really dramatic lighting. Um, and the dramatic lighting adds to this feeling of like, you know, the drama of the scene. Um, and I told you this, that we're positioned as if we're like in the place of Saul. Okay, I told you that, yeah? Okay, um, what else do we want? Oh, simplified composition, we talked about that. The flat black background, we talked about that. Um, and again, and I've mentioned this a few times, like that this is meant to be like, um, it's meant to have an emotional impact. It's meant as a, as a religious, spiritual, that like you as the viewer like you might be like Saul you might not be into Christianity at this moment but you can have a transformative experience you can personally have that you know relationship with Jesus that brings you back to the church and this is what the church is hoping for because the church has lost a lot of followers to Protestantism right here's another great one I love this painting so much this is Caravaggio's um, The Doubting Thomas from 1602. Do you know the story of Doubting Thomas? No. Yes. Somebody, yes. somebody knows it. Tell us the story. Uh, this was during, uh, after Christ's uh, uh, crucifixion. When he comes back, resurrected, Thomas is like one of the only apostles who like didn't believe it. So like when Christ does appear before him, Christ is like, come touch my, like, my wounds and my side. Exactly, right? So Jesus died, he's crucified, he dies, and then he's resurrected, right? And um, his followers, most of his followers are like, hey, Jesus is back, right? And Thomas is like, that's not how it works. Like, that's not <laughs> a real thing. Like, people don't come back to life, you know? And his followers are like, no, for real. Like, Jesus is back, man. Um, and Thomas goes, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when I stick my finger in his wound. Then I'll believe it. Well, Jesus is like, what'd you say? Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Jesus appears to, to Thomas and he's like, yeah, come and put your finger in my wound. Like I'm, it's me, I'm here, I'm back. Um, so this is a depiction of Thomas. Um, so this is Jesus right here with the nude torso um, and Thomas who Jesus has taken Thomas's hand and is like pushing his hand into his wound. So right. um, it's, a little bit gruesome, I think, in the same way that like Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith and Holofernes is kind of gruesome with the blood splattering, like in this instance, like sticking his hand, his finger in a wound. Like I hope he used hand sanitizer before he did that, you know? Right. Like it's a kind of gruesome moment. 
Um, how is this typical of the Baroque period? In terms of style, just looking at it, we see the, the type composition, only the essential figures are there. It's just right. four people, right? We don't have a whole background of a bunch of people. It's just Thomas and Jesus and two followers. Tight, tight composition, simplified composition, just the essential figures, this flat back background that's just black or dark brown, no landscape, no sense of the Italian countryside rolling behind them, um, really dramatic tenebrism. The light is shining on these figures as if they're on a stage and lit with a spotlight. And we, as the viewer, are pulled into this tight composition as if we're in the room with them witnessing this. We're seeing Thomas stick his finger into Jesus's wound. And if you look at Thomas and the other followers, you'll see like a really sort of honest, naturalistic depiction of what his followers might have looked like. Not idealized, not beautiful, like true to life, like red noses and wrinkled foreheads and receding hairlines and tattered clothes. Look at Thomas's got a, a, a rip on his shirt and dirty fingernails. Thomas's fingernails are dirty, right? So these holy figures, this was kind of dramatic for people, holy figures depicted as if they were like, you know, kind of like working class people, right? People who have dirty fingernails and are sunburned from working outside, right? So they're really depicted as humble, regular everyday individuals so that you, the viewer, me and you, when we're viewing this in 1602, we can see ourselves in Thomas. We can see that maybe we have been doubting too, right? And when we see this image, maybe we will like renew our faith in Jesus, just like Thomas did. And this is the message of people, like Jesus didn't turn Thomas away, right? He did. Jesus was like, oh, you need proof here? I'll give you proof, right? Yeah. So Jesus was like, you know, it's okay if you doubt, but like, I want you to have faith in me again, right? So this is kind of the message uh, of the painting. And this is, again, the message that the church wants to give to the people, that if you lost away or you strayed away or left for some reason, you can go back. You can start believing again, just like Thomas. Like, if you were doubting, like, let your doubts be cast aside and return, right? So this, again, is the message um, of a painting like this. Another thing that um, was really kind of wild at the time was that Caravaggio, and I think I mentioned this earlier, used lived models. Like, he would take people off the street, he'd meet people in the pub and be like, come back to my studio, I want to paint you, you know? And he would paint like some drunk guy as like you know, a saint or whatever. So um, we have like a pretty mystical moment um, depicted in like a very kind of gritty, earthy, true to life way. Does this make sense? Yes. Yeah. 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 So a mystical moment depicted in a very real way. The same thing with the calling of St. Matthew. Right? And I told you this earlier. It, Jesus, this is Jesus depicted in a contemporary pub, right? And these um, figures are sort of like hanging out in a tavern, playing poker, drinking, dressed in like contemporary fashion. Um, but they're being, you know, depicted as they're holy figures, right? So holy figures depicted in a very real or kind of honest way. Uh, let me show you a couple more Caravaggios. Earlier, I told you about um, the painting. This is the death of the Virgin. So this figure in the red um, is meant to be the Virgin Mary. Um, and this was like pretty scandalous at the time. This was um, commissioned by a lawyer for the Pope um, who wanted this painted for a church. Um, and it actually was rejected by the church when it was um, presented by Caravaggio because they said that this was an undignified way of um, depicting the Virgin Mary um, that um, supposedly Caravaggio had used the body, the dead body of a prostitute who a prostitute had been killed or um, had fallen into the river and drowned and her body was pulled out of the river and she was like sort of bloated um, as I don't know, I guess bodies do when they are in water. 
Um, and this really scandalized people. Like they thought that this was like not the proper way to depict holy figures. And so it was rejected. And this actually happened to Caravaggio a lot that his paintings were rejected because the way he was depicting holy figures was unlike anything people had ever really seen before, right? Like holy figures were in the middle ages, these like you know, living in the golden skies in heaven. And during the Renaissance, they were depicted as more human, but still perfect, right? Still idealized and beautiful. And here, Caravaggio is depicting them as like almost too human. Like they're too similar to us. Um, and this really scandalized people um, at the time. They, they, they weren't all into the way Caravaggio painted. Here's another Caravaggio entombment. So this is when Jesus has been <clears throat> taken down from the cross and is being placed in the tomb. Um, and again, you see like um, sort of regular everyday people, um, flawed humans um, depicted in this kind of holy act. You see strong diagonal lines, um, a sense of drama. This woman, you know, I don't know, I think that it was that Mary Magdalene or something, raising up her arms um, in despair. So a sense of emotion uh, and drama, the flat back background, the lack of the landscape, the warm color palette, the dramatic strong colors, like none of that soft pastel idealized um, stuff that we see with the Renaissance. Um, another artist who I talked about already um, is Artemisia Gentileschi. Um, so I talked about her at the beginning of class today, and I also talked about her um, another time um, when I was talking about female artists specifically. Um, I want to um, show you, uh, share with you a quote um, that she actually wrote in 1649. She wrote, people have cheated me. If I were a man, I can't imagine it would have turned out so. So she was really aware of like how her like status as a woman affected her life as an artist. She was an artist at a time when most women were not allowed to become artists, were not allowed to paint. Um, her father was an artist and actually um, after she died, many of her paintings were wrongly attributed to her father. Um, and only recently, and I mean really recently, like since the 1980s, have scholars, feminist art historians have gone back and looked at work um, in the archives, in the museum storage, and have found out that like these paintings were done by Artemisia, not her father. Um, and so she's been sort of like saved from oblivion. Like, I mean, she, if you, like my mom took an art history class in college, Artemisia Gentileschi was not in her art history book. Like this is some, this is an artist who has been like rewritten back into history because art historians have been like, hello, um, we have been like totally ignoring this artist um, and misattributing paintings to her father. Um, and in fact, some people, if you look at her paintings and her father's paintings, some people think that she surpassed her father. Um, her life story, she had, lives a difficult and interesting life. Um, she, her father allows her to learn to paint something that was rare for women at the time. Um, and she insists and she wants to get a teacher. Um, and usually like this is the typical way of learning to paint is that you, you, you become an apprentice, right? So she has, um, her dad hooks her up with a teacher and supposedly, you know, in this um, relationship when she's going to his studio to learn to paint, he assaults or sexually assaults her. Um, and we know this because this is recorded in court cases. So you can actually read the transcript if you want to really nerd out. Um, you can read the transcript of the court case. Um, it wasn't um, illegal at the time for men to rape women, um, but it was illegal um, if for um, property to be damaged. And at the time, women were considered property of their fathers until they were like given to their husbands. And so this was her father's claim was that well, now that her virginity has been taken, because at the time virginity was like um, a thing that was like essential to getting married. Um, and getting married was like what most women I think we lost you. Uh, uh -oh. Oh, no. We lost her. 
No, but she's got to be on because we're all still on. Well, it said Megan had left the chat. Oh, no. She might have disconnected or something. Could have just, like, ran out of battery. Then I'll text Probably. Her. Or did someone tell her to press Alt F4? Oof. <laughs> I'll send her a text. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> oh. oh. Okay. There. She's back. Hi. Sorry. Welcome back. I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. I'm back. Professor, <laughs> Professor, I had a question, and it's regarding the previous topic. Uh, when you mentioned that uh, the artwork was rejected by the church. Mm -hmm. what it then what did the artist do with that artwork oh that's a really good question you know I think um, each one is different so like some so some of the paintings that Caravaggio made when they were rejected he like in a rage smashed them and destroyed them so some of them we don't have other ones he might have just returned to his studio maybe at a later date somebody came and purchased it um, or maybe it was just sort of abandoned and like lost somewhere and then hundreds of years later, like shows up in a church attic or, you know, so each painting will have like a different history. Um, but in those, in Caravaggio's early years, um, his paintings were often rejected because people didn't really get what he was doing, right? Like they, they thought what he was doing was offensive. They thought what he was doing was somehow like against what the church you know was about and he was like i'm trying to show you a new way i'm trying to like make a new image of holy figures and people just didn't get it like they were really scandalized so that kind of happened in the early years later once people started like he started becoming popular and people started liking his paintings like then he was greatly sought out sought after they were like you know clamoring to commission him so that was just in the early years Anybody else have any questions? Okay, I had a second question in regards to that. And uh -huh. maybe you've already answered it and maybe I missed it. Uh, so in the Renaissance period, uh, artists were commissioned to paint churches, like the inside walls. Mm -hmm. uh, did that also happen with the Baroque period or was it just, um, just... That's a great question as well, not really. So in the Baroque period, because of the rise of the popularity of oil painting, um, we see a major shift away from frescoes to oil paintings on canvas. Mostly so canvas. the artists, artists would paint on canvas. So the artists would be in their studio using oil paint and painting on the canvas. And then the painting would be delivered to the church. Okay. Yeah, and it's mostly just because oil painting replaces frescoes. Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna keep talking about um, um, Gentileschi. My my computer, my laptop died, and I just plugged it in, so hopefully it'll come back. Um, but I'll keep talking about Gentileschi. Um, so she is, um, like I said, this female artist who is like sort of rescued by contemporary art historians. So now we know a lot about her. Um, because of what art historians have found out in the past 10 or 20 years. Um, so anyway, um, so there's this court case. So her dad basically, like, her dad technically owns her and is like, well, my property has been damaged because now I can't marry her off because she's been assaulted by her, um, her art teacher, right? So this is why it goes to court. She is seeking, like, money from the art teacher to like pay for like damaging his goods or whatever i mean you know by all accounts actually like he did care about his daughter um which is why he like allowed her to like learn art and everything um so you know anyway you can read about the court case um because because this thing happened we have the court case we have the transcript like the text from the court case um in the way in the end um the like you know solution is that she has to marry her art teacher because nobody at the time is going to want to marry a woman who's not a virgin which is like i know it's a wild thing but this is how it was at the time so she ends up having to marry her art teacher who yes like that's the person who assaulted her um so she has to marry this guy so she has like a 
pretty difficult life, um, I think is like an understatement. Um, and is like lives with this guy. Um, but anyway, she ends up continuing her work as a painter um, and paints subject matter. It's all approved subject matter, subject matter that the church is okay with. But she specifically seeks out and chooses subject matter where women are these like heroines of the story where women, um, you know, take their power back, um, you know, save the day. So if you look at the story of Judith and Holofernes, um, you see that like Judith is this powerful woman who saves the day and like saves her whole town from this Assyrian um, general Holofernes, right? Um, and so this is the kind of subject matter that she is attracted to. Oh, good. My computer's back. I'm going to go back to the um, slideshow. Hold on. Abby, are you drawing? I'm doing a watercolor thing. Oh, pretty. It's a palette that I got, and I'm messing around with it. Oh. So I'm trying to see like how it works and everything. And Ryan's and, like, super comfortable. That's the water palette. Okay, now I want you to look at this painting because this is, can you see my screen? Yes. This is a self-portrait of Artemisia. This is the artist self-portrait. So this is her painting herself. And then I want you to look at um, her paintings of um, Judith and Holofernes, especially this one. And if you look at her self-portraits and then you look at her paintings of Judith, a lot of scholars say that like, it looks like she's painting herself as Judith. Oh, it does look like her. So kind of like maybe she's like imagining, you know, being Judith, like imagining being this like empowered woman who's like getting, some people say it's like a revenge fantasy, you know, where she's like getting back um, at like all of these um, people who have like tried to like hinder her in her path. Um, but anyway, she paints Judith beheading Holofernes over and over and over and over again. There are multiple, so this is a different painting by the same artist, um, same subject matter, but a different, a slightly different painting as you can Oh see. yeah, right, it looks, uh, the colors are different and she looks a little different too. Yeah, so this one's a little bit different, um, but, she, but she paints, here's another one, this is after the fact. So here's Judith and the maid servant and the head of Holofernes, so this is kind of after. Um, this is more like um, the Botticelli one that we saw, right? Um, but in terms of style, we see all of these like typical Baroque um, characteristics, right? Um, the tight composition, the dark dramatic lighting. Um, in this case, there's literally a candle. Can you see the candle? Yeah. There's the literally is... this candle that she's held up her hand to. And then her hand casts a shadow on her face, right? So we have all this really dramatic lighting, um, this tight composition, um, strong diagonal lines. Um, all of this is typical of the Baroque. And the, uh, I noticed that on the Baroque, uh, the women are, or actually everyone, has dark hair, darker skin. And the Renaissance, if I'm not mistaken, there were a lot of fair skinned people with blonde hair. Yeah, so this is one thing that you might notice that the artists, it's not like people stayed the same. It's just that the artists in the Baroque period are depicting people like more true to how they looked in the 17th century. Whereas like in the Renaissance, artists were painting an ideal of a, a romanticized ideal version, like especially if you're looking at depictions of Venus, right? They're painting this like blonde ideal version of Venus. Whereas here, these artists, they're looking at contemporary models and they're okay. painting like, this is what people actually look like in 1610 in Rome, right? So this is more like true to life in a way. Um, I think let's look at one comparison um, because both of these paintings are Baroque paintings. So earlier we compared a Baroque and um, a Renaissance painting. Now let's compare two Baroque paintings. These are both Baroque paintings 
The one on the left is by Caravaggio. The one on the right is by Artemisia Gentileschi. We can see that it's the same subject matter, Judith beheading Holofernes. We can see that there are both, they're similar styles, flat black background, warm earthy tones, tight composition, um, intimate like feeling that there's, you know, we're in the room with the figures. Um, the moment of action, like the head is being chopped off in this moment. And in fact, Artemisia Gentileschi looked at the work of Caravaggio. She was very much influenced by Caravaggio. She loved his paintings. She looked at his paintings and was like, I'm going to paint like that, right? So he was like really a trendsetter at the time. Well, let's look at these two paintings and talk about any possible differences. They're about 22 years apart from each other. Do you see, do you see any differences? Well, the, what I noticed is the uh, the one on the left, the um, she looks very angelic, very mm -hmm. calm as she's cutting off his head. Uh huh. And on the right, she looks she's putting all her body into it, all her force into it. Exactly, and this is exactly what Jess is saying in the chat. Um, Jess says. Caravaggio depicts Judith in a more timid manner. So yes, I, you see Judith here. Um, she looks angelic. Um, she's also got like a slight build. Um, she looks like kind of reluctant to do this act of chopping this guy's head off. Look at all the space between her body and his body, right? She's got him at an arm's length distance. Whereas um, Gentileschi um, is, her Judith is like, she's got her leg up on the bed. She's climbed onto the bed and she's got, she's holding his head down and she's really close to him, right? Um, so Gentileschi's Judith is more powerful, more forceful, um, is more determined. She's like, I'm chopping this guy's head off. Whereas Caravaggio's Judith is like, oh, I don't really want to do this, but like, I have to do this thing to save my village, right? So she's more reluctant. Yeah, I was about to say, it's, it almost looks like the comparison, like how in PE they say, oh, don't be that girl that stands in the corner and does nothing. I can see Caravaggio's um, Judith being the one girl in PE that stands in the corner and Gentileschi's is the one that like gets in there, plays all rough, fights yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, more aggressive, right? Yeah. 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 Gentileschi's Judith is more aggressive. And Jess just pointed out a really great point. Um, look at the role of the maidservant, right? So Caravaggio's maidservant is this older woman who's just waiting there with the bag. She's going to catch the head, right? Gentileschi's maidservant is a younger woman like Judith who is helping Judith. She's holding him down and he's trying to punch her in the face and she's holding him down. So she's like, there's like some solidarity there where she's like really involved with Judith. Pretty odd too. I mean, considering the age difference between the two uh, different uh, maidservants. Right, right. Yeah, well, you can see that Gentileschi's conceiving of the maidservant, like, not as somebody watching it, but somebody who's also participating in the action. Right. Right. And then, uh, and Caravaggio's, the, um, uh, the male, he looks very toned, very buff. You can tell his muscles. Oh, so yeah. You find. It's true. Yeah. And over here, Gentileschi's Holofernes, he's not that muscular for a general, huh? Yeah. Just interesting that the same style, they're both Baroque, but huh? they, that they're different in so many different ways. Uh-huh. So we have same subject matter and they're both Baroque, but the individual artists have their own style. And I would argue that like Gentileschi being a woman depicts the subject matter um, in a different way, right? Because of her, I think because of her personal life experience, like she thinks of the story in a different way, you know? Right. Um, and somebody said, why would Caravaggio decide to depict Judas maid as older? Actually, that's the typical way of depicting Judas maid servant. So 
Gentileschi is the one who decides to depict the maid as like young woman, just like her. But like typically in depictions of Judith and Holofernes, um, the maid servant is depicted as an older woman. Oh, okay. So, so because the is kind of maids are that. like to guide them, like teach them. That's why I would think that they're much older so that that way they can pass down wisdom. Yeah, to, they're like, kind of like, you know, a maid servant is kind of like an au pair or a nanny or somebody who watches over you as you grow up. And then, you know, once you become an adult, she's always like there watching over you. Um, so yeah, Gentileski's, to me, Gentileski's depicting this young maid servant is like a call for solidarity for like women to like stick together and like, right. like you know, teamwork, like man together or something, you know, like that's how I read it. Yeah. Yeah, and Albert says Caravaggio's depiction of Judith show his view on women. So I think that's a really good way of putting it. Like Car Caravaggio is depicting how he thinks a woman would feel having to do this task, right? Like, oh, a woman wouldn't want to do that. A woman wouldn't want to like chop a guy's head off, right? Yeah. So she's going to be reluctant. Right. And how Caravaggio depicts her is beautiful because this is how Caravaggio wants women to be right. Like attractive and angelic and beautiful and afraid of violence. And Gentileschi is like, we're not afraid of violence. Like you know, we felt it, we can dealt to deal it too. You know, like it's a totally different um, way of looking at it. And I think this is a good way of putting it. Like Caravaggio depicts his view um, and Gentileschi is depicting her view. Oh, that's such a good point. I mean, and that just goes in general for any artwork, right? Any piece, the art, I mean, the artist is going to put in, draw it the way they're feeling it, the way they're seeing it. Exactly. It's like such a personal perspective. Um, oh, it's 520. Um, I want to, um, I want to show you one more artist um, before we go. So I'm going to, um, this is a really good conversation. I'm so glad you're all here and we're talking about this, but I just want to move forward um, because I want to talk about um, Bernini. So um, you can look at the PowerPoint. You can look at some other examples. I do some other comparisons of like Renaissance um, art and um, Baroque art. Um, here I'm comparing a Renaissance depiction of Susanna and the elders and Gentileschi's depiction of Susanna and the elders. And you should read the story. It's another biblical story where like a woman gets wronged and then wins in the end. Um, so read that one. Um, but what I wanna move on to is I wanna talk about um, Bernini uh, and Italian sculpture during the Baroque period. Um, and then next week I'll talk about Spanish art and Northern art. So this is the one thing that I want to show you. So Bernini, John Lorenzo Bernini is like the most important sculptor of the Baroque period. He's known for all of these um, fountains, um, these sculptures that he makes um, for public spaces in Rome. So here you're looking at the Fountain of the Four Rivers in Piazza Navona, one of the like the big tourist attractions in Rome. Um, and so Bernini's sculptures like are all around Rome. Um, we have looked earlier in the semester at Apollo and Daphne, um, this is another sculpture by Bernini. We've already discussed this. So what I want to look at um, is Bernini's David. And I think this really kind of, again, sums up Baroque art in one piece. Um, and it really is visible when we compare it to um, Michelangelo and Donatello's David. So wow. remember the story of David is, you know, this young teenage boy who fights Goliath with a slingshot um, and wins. And then David eventually goes on to become a king and becomes this like really important biblical figure, right? So we know the story. And we look at these sculptures and we see Donatello's David, Michelangelo's David, um, and Bernini's David. And I think we can really get a sense of that Baroque style. First of all, we're mid action. Michelangelo's David is before the action. He's got the slingshot. He's looking off into the distance, contemplating like about thinking about this giant that he's going to fight against. Bernini's David is mid action. In fact, he, it looks like he's just 
um, slung the rock, right? His body is twisting um, and he's got this slingshot thing in his hand and he's just flung this rock um, at this giant and look at his face. His face is like in, you know, this like really tense concentration, right? He's got, he's going like this with his lips. What do you guys, do you have concentration faces? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what yours is? Mine, I didn't know this until a friend, I was cutting something and a friend was taking a picture of me. Mine's like this. <laughs> like the emoji. <laughs> I stick my tongue out when I'm concentrating. I stick my tongue out. Some people might go, mm, like bite their lips. Um, here you can see um, David, Bernini's David has this furrowed brow, right? These lines on his forehead. This is all indicating that he's in this moment of concentration. Hi, Kitty. He's biting his lip. He's biting his lip, right? So we see like he's mid-action. He's not, he's not contemplating like Michelangelo's David. He's mid-action. Um, let's look at some more images of the David so you can see all of the, the twisting of the body, all of the um, positioning of the legs and the arms create these strong diagonal lines, which is typical of Baroque art. It creates a sense of drama and movement. Um, we have the implied presence of Goliath, right? That's who David is looking at. Um, we're, we're seeing the moment of action. Um, and his body is kind of coiled and turning and twisting as opposed to just calmly standing there. And if you look at the sculpture, the sculpture is meant to be seen in the round from all the different sides. Whereas Renaissance sculptures are meant to be seen kind of frontally, almost like a painting. Professor, why, um, why is it that even like Donatello's or Michelangelo's, they don't, they're naked and then Bernini covers it up? This is a great question. Um, so remember um, when we talked about the Renaissance and we we're talking about kind of like this rebirth of classical art, most um, Greek sculptures of men, they're usually either depicting warriors, um, athletes, or gods. Those figures would be nude. That's the classical Greek tradition of depicting these figures as nude. As we move into the Baroque period, and remember the Council of Trent? The Council right. of Trent establishes these new rules. One of the rules is no more sexy nudity in religious art. Do you remember Bronzino's altarpiece with all those sexy naked ladies on it? Yes. Yeah. Do you remember Titian's Mary Magdalene with her breasts out? Yes. Mm -hmm. All yes. that kind of stuff. The church was like, no more. No more oh, nudity. Okay. We don't, we can't see that in religious art anymore. So Bernini, when he's creating this sculpture, he makes this like little piece of fabric cover over David's genitalia. And in okay. fact, do you know what they did in the Baroque period? They mm -hmm. went around to classical sculptures in Rome, like ancient Roman sculptures, and they put little fig leaves over all of the genitalia. <laughs> they did that. Some, some of them have been removed, but some of them, if you see a fig leaf on it, it was added in the Baroque period. The, uh, the Bernini has a lot of, it shows all the action and the movement, and you can see that there's, you know, that there's, he's involved. However, Michelangelo looks, looks really pretty, and you can see all the detail and his structure. It's, it's like, you, it's like they almost gave up quality for movement. Michelangelo's, yeah, Michelangelo's is, um, very idealized. It's very beautiful. It's very, it's kind of like an intellectual contemplation of the beauty of the human form, right? Um, it is beautiful. It's beautiful sculpture to look at. Uh, but Bernini's is more immediate, more emotional, more like this is what a guy looks like when he's fighting, right? When he's twisting. It's not so much about the beauty of David's right. body. It's more about depicting that moment of action. But yes, there is this sense of sacrificing beauty because this is what Baroque artists say. Renaissance artists were obsessed with beauty. And we Baroque artists, Bernini, Caravaggio, Gentileschi, and others, we care more about authenticity than beauty. It's more important to be real 
than to be beautiful, right? It's kind of like now, like people yeah. posting pictures with like, you know, stretch marks and cellulite and acne. And it's like, this is what I really look like. Like not the airbrushed version of me, the real version of me. Authenticity is what is valued during the Baroque period, more so than beauty, um, logic, peace. Like those are not important. <laughs> being authentic, being true, being real is more important. We saw that also in the Northern Italian Renaissance, or the, the Northern Renaissance area, is it? Didn't we? Yes, yes. In fact, yeah, that's a good point. Like when we were looking at Northern Renaissance art, it was more emotional. It was more honest. It was less idealized, less beautiful maybe, but somehow more authentic, right? And this is that same idea these Northern Renaissance artists, these ideas um, become popular in Italian Baroque art. Well, that's a, such a good way of explaining it. Thank you. Uh, you know, I saw some of Bernini's in person and I didn't like them, but I didn't know the history behind them. Yeah, now I think- so if you Now I understand it. it. And you'll see the difference. Like you'll, you can really see the difference between Baroque and Renaissance when you look at these Davids next to each other. Um, I want to show you one last, I know it's time to go, so if you got to go, go, but I want to show you one last sculpture um, by Bernini. It's in a chapel, in a church that's pretty close to the train station in Rome, um, and it's a depiction of um, Saint Teresa in this moment of ecstasy. So this is the sculpture right here, and this is all this stuff around it. Um, but I'm gonna zoom into the sculpture so you can see it more closely. This is Saint Teresa, who is being pierced with the arrow um, by this angel who's about to stab her with this arrow and fill her with the love of God. So what's the story? This is a depiction of a, um, a Spanish nun who is, um, a Carmelite, um, and these nuns take a vow of poverty and they get rid of all their possessions and they're known as barefoot Carmelites because they don't even have shoes, right? They give up everything. Um, and she, this Carmelite nun, has this experience where she is overwhelmed by the love of God. She has a mystical experience and she writes about it. Um, and she writes her visions and her ecstasies in these um, letters that she later publishes. And she uses the metaphor of romantic love to explain her feelings of love that she gets um, from Jesus. So I'm gonna read this quote to you. This is from her writing. This is St. Teresa wrote this. I saw in his hand, she's talking about the angel, a long spear of gold and at the iron's point, there seemed to be a little fire. So it's like an arrow that's on fire. He appeared to me to be thrusting it at times into my heart and to pierce my very entrails. So she's getting stabbed by an arrow that's on fire right into her heart. And it's going so deep into her, it's going down to her intestines, right? So she's getting stabbed by this arrow. Um, and she's talking about this angel. When he drew it out, he seemed to draw them out also, her intestines or entrails, and to leave me all on fire with a great love of God. The pain was so great that it made me moan, and yet so surpassing was the sweetness of this excessive pain that I could not wish to be rid of it. The soul is satisfied now with nothing less than God. The pain is not bodily, but spiritual, though the body has its share in it. It is a caressing of love so sweet, which now takes place between the soul and God, that I pray God of his goodness to make him experience it, who may think that I am lying. So she's telling this story of being overwhelmed, of having this ecstatic experience and being overwhelmed by the love of God. And she's using what I would say is like a pretty thinly veiled sexual metaphor of like being pierced by this arrow that's on fire and filling her with love and causing her pain and causing her to moan, right? Like there are like pretty clear like sexual undertones and this like, romantic or sexual subject matter is a metaphor to explain divine love. So sexual love or romantic love is used to explain divine love and how she feels being overwhelmed 
by this sense of love that she gets from God, right? That happens in this ecstatic moment for her. Um, and so this moment is what's then depicted in Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa. Um, so you see Teresa depicted um, in a lot of drama and glory, like the, this, this um, cloak or robe that she's wearing, it's like so dramatic and too much, right? Like it's, it's over the top, all of this, like um, all the folds of the fabric and the movement. Um, if you look, zoom in and look at the face um, of the angel, the angel is looking at um, St. Teresa with a very loving face. And if you look at the face of St. Teresa, um, you see like, really uh, a face in ecstasy, a face in this like moment of being filled with the love of Christ, a, a transformative moment, a moment of personal transformation. And this is what the Baroque period artists love, right? Saul getting knocked off his horse, um, Thomas sticking his finger in a wound, Matthew being called to leave poker and drinking and follow Jesus, right? And here this nun um, having this transformative moment where like her life is never going to be the same again after she feels this love, right? Um, after she feels this ecstasy. So this, this moment of spiritual transformation is, this, um, is what's depicted um, in this sculpture by Bernini. We also see really strong diagonal lines with the positioning of the two figures, the arrow um, that's about to stab the nun and fill her with this love, um, the angel with this like kind of sweet loving smile. All this interest in emotions um, and romantic love are again this metaphor for divine love. But this is not the kind of thing you would see in the Renaissance. Like in the Renaissance things would be measured and restrained and logical and here it's like you're being urged to like you know give in to that feeling of love right one thing that i want to point out is that originally um there was a window built above um the sculpture um and so that sunlight could come in and shine down onto the sculpture so like caravaggio playing with dramatic lighting in his painting Bernini is doing the same thing with sculpture. Now the window has been replaced with like an electric light bulb or whatever. Um, but light is being thought of as an element that's brought into the sculpture. Ooh. Interesting. Um, okay, so I think with that, um, I'll end the discussion um, of uh, Baroque art in Italy. Hopefully you got a couple things out of it. Did you? Yes, this was really good. Thank you. Was it good? Um, Very okay, good. so next week um, I'll talk about Baroque art in Spain and Baroque art in the north. I probably won't take the whole time because you know we took about an hour today talking about the assignment so we'll probably finish early next week just FYI. Yeah? Okay. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions? No. Cheyenne, can you stay? I'm going to talk to you at the end. Yes. Yeah? Yes, I will. Okay. Anybody have any questions about anything? Everything was really good today. Thank you. I guess I'll just wait for an email or text from my from Brianna regarding the, oh, the, yeah. group, the group project. Yeah, so your groups text each other, email each other, start thinking about possible topics, um, things that you want to study. Um, and then I'll post, I posted a discussion um, on Canvas where you can post, oh, here's my group and here's our topic that we want to do. And I'll reply to you right in Canvas. Great. So try to get used to using Canvas because that's where we're going to be like communicating. Okay, that and here on Mondays, I'll be in Zoom here for you. So like hopefully, oh. hopefully <laughs> this still feels kind of like class. It, it does. It just feels a little bit, well, for me, it was uh, tiring. I, I don't know about anyone else, but I just felt more tired. Yeah. Taking it online. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not the same. Uh, I like sitting on my couch, though. Yeah, no, this was great. This is good. <laughs>
Good. I'm glad you liked it. Okay. So if you have any questions, email me, message me on Canvas. I'm glad you liked it. Come back next week. All right. And like I said, I'm going to, um, the, the discussion question is there, so you can answer that whenever you want. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. It was very informative. It was very you educational still. You again, the discussion. Can we wait? Do you want me to show you that again, where it is on, hold on, yes, share screen. I'll show you just one more time where the discussion is. So if you go to, go to modules mm -hmm. and we just started uh, modules, we just started talking about the Baroque period. So you scroll down and you click here on Italian Baroque art and you'll see the PowerPoint from today and then you know, if there is any artwork in there that I didn't talk about, but that you want to know about, um, you could watch some of these videos that I post. Um, so it looks like these ones, see, I didn't talk about the crucifixion of St. Peter. You can watch that video. Um, you can watch this video about Bernini's David, so you can see like more views of David. Um, and then if you click next, you'll see um, the question. So basically, I want you to choose a work of art by one of these um, artists. So Caravaggio, Gentileschi, Reni, Sirani, some of the other. So you can look in the book too. any other Italian Baroque artists. And then you're going to answer these four questions um, here on Canvas. Yeah, but that's the group activity. This is the discussion forum. Oh, okay, discussion forum. Okay, oh, okay. perfect. That's the discussion forum. Um, which takes the place of the exams, which is not the same as the group project. Got it. Okay. It's two separate things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Nope. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Bye. Okay, Cheyenne, I'll talk to you. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Okay, how do I just make it so it's just me and you talking? I do not know. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Are you frozen? Oh. No, I'm just trying to figure out how to, like, Lynn. <laughs> I'll just, right, there we go. Oops. Okay. Let me end the recording. Stop recording.